So welcome back to week two of PLIN 0006 Introduction to Language. Last week, we talked a little bit about what we mean when we talk about language and what it is that we as linguists are interested in. Particularly, we talked about the faculty of language and something called knowledge of language or short K-O-L. And we said that we're really interested in knowing what it is that speakers know about their language, and we saw that we can break that down into a number of questions. For example, what do people know about the sound structure of their language? What do they know about the word structure, the sentence structure, and so on? So today we're going to start our foray into the area of sounds as they're used in spoken languages. There are two parts to that. There is sound structure, of course, how individual speech sounds can be combined in languages to form word forms, etc. But there's also the more fundamental question of how speech sounds pattern with each other, how they are grouped and how they're produced. And it turns out those two issues are very closely tied to one another. And that's the area of study that we're going to look at today, which is phonetics. There'll be two videos today. In the first of these videos, we'll be focusing on the background to phonetics, a little bit on the gross anatomy that is involved in producing speech sounds. And then we'll be diving into the consonants of English and how they can be described and transcribed. And then in the second video, we'll be looking at the vowels of English. And even though today we're going to principally focus on English with what you learn and with the help of resources that you can easily find in the textbook, online, etc., um, you will nonetheless be able to explore the same questions in all of the world's languages. And you should get enough of an understanding today um, that you'll be able to explore the sounds of all the languages of the world, even though we'll only be covering that part which is really relevant to English. So what is phonetics? Well, Phonetics, in simple terms, is the study of human speech sounds. And there are several ways in which we can just approach, several sub-questions we can ask, if you will, and they lead to so-called sub-fields of phonetics. So we could divide phonetics into the field of articulatory phonetics, which is interested in how speech sounds are produced, how they're articulated. We could also look at the question of how these sounds are perceived how audition, the auditory system, features in that process, that would be the field of auditory phonetics. And then finally, we could also ask about the physical properties of speech sounds as they're propagated as sound waves um, between speakers. That is studied principally in the field of acoustic phonetics. Today, um, we'll be focusing exclusively on the question of articulatory phonetics, even though the other two areas of study are also really relevant and really interesting and really useful if you get the chance to explore them further for the fundamentals for what we're going to need for the next couple of weeks and also to gain a basic understanding of how speech sounds seem to be organized to the mind of speakers. The most insightful approach that we can take right now is that of articulatory phonetics and so that's what we'll be focusing on. So specifically Today, what we'll be looking at is the transcription of speech sounds. How can we, in a uniform and agreed manner, describe what actual sounds people are using and producing in their speech and how speech varies from one speaker to the other? Then we'll be looking at the articulation of speech sounds. So how the individual anatomical parts of your vocal tract conspire together to produce the various sounds of language. And then finally, we'll be looking at the question of how these speech sounds can be grouped or classified in a systematic manner. So before we can really dive into articulatory phonetics and into the transcription of speech sounds, we first of all need to become clear of the 
things that are at stake here. So let's have a little look at this poem by Gerard North Trinité called The Chaos. Dearest creature in creation, study English pronunciation. I will teach you in my verse sounds like corpse, corpse, horse, and worse. I will keep you, Susie, busy, make your head with heed grow dizzy. Tear in eye, your dress will tear, so shall I or hear my prayer. So you're probably getting a pretty good idea here that things that look visually like they should rhyme often don't rhyme in English. And similarly, things that are spelled quite radically differently from one another might end up rhyming. For example, we have the pair tear and prayer, which are spelled quite differently apart from, you know, both ending in an R. And we wouldn't necessarily expect that they would rhyme, especially if you speak another language that has a more systematic spelling system than English. Um, you might expect that they should rhyme, but in fact, they don't. So there's something amiss here that in that spelling doesn't quite reflect the language as it is spoken accurately. So let's play a little game of spelling bee, a game that doesn't work in many languages because spelling is too predictive, but is quite a fun game to play in English, of course. So here's a word that I can guarantee you have heard before, but you might not have seen spelled this way. So I would suggest you pause the video at this point and just try and figure out what these letters are trying to spell. Well, it's quite simple, really. The word that we have here spells fish. We have GH as in the last two letters of the word cough. Then we have a letter O as in the O of the plural of women. And then we have a TI as we have it in nation. So that makes the sounds F, E, and SH, fish. The only reason, of course, why we can toy around with things like this in English is because the English spelling system is in such disarray nowadays due to the fact that spelling in English is based on the etymology, on the history of words in English, rather than on the current pronunciation. Once upon a time, of course, English spelling was based on how things were pronounced. For example, you're all familiar with the word night, which is, of course, spelled N-I-G-H, T, and here the GH hasn't been silent in the past. The GH used to be pronounced H, as you find in words of, for example, Scottish origin nowadays, as in Loch. And this word used to be pronounced Nicht once upon a time. Then the H sound got lost and the vowel changed from E to something like I. You will see these symbols more later on. And so we arrived at the word night, which really we might think we should spell like this nowadays, but we still spell as though it was pronounced nicht. However, there are also a couple of things that we need to come to grips with here that are not specific to English. For example, if we compare spelling across different languages, we see that such a problem exists also on an international scale. Take, for example, these two words here. Spell differently at the beginning of the word, nonetheless, they're pronounced the same. On the left-hand side, you find the German spelling of the word fleece. And on the right-hand side, you find the English spelling of the word fleece, pronounced exactly the same, spelled differently. Now have a look at this triplet of words. The first, again, is German and is pronounced whisky. Whisky. The second, of course, is English, pronounced whisky. Whisky. And the third is the Japanese variant pronounced something like whisky. Whisky. So what we can see here is that words can be spelled the same as in the case of the German and the English variant, except perhaps for the capitalization, yet pronounced differently. And then we can have a radically different spelling system, such as the katakana of Japanese here, and yet have a very similar pronunciation. So what is the best system to choose? What is the best way in which we can write things down in such a way that another person will know how they should be pronounced or if they present a record of something that happened in the past, how they were pronounced? Do you see the problem here? 
Behold of the red screen of doom, letters are not sounds. So clearly there is a set of requirements here that we as linguists have that ordinary spelling cannot satisfy. So we need a agreed convention of transcribing things. And there are two requirements that we principally have of a transcription system that we can adopt for human speech sounds. First of all, the system must be unambiguous. So we want a correspondence of one symbol to one value. One sound, one symbol. Secondly, the system needs to take care of this international problem. We need to make sure that the one symbol, one value desideratum is not only met in a language like English or in a language like German, but that it's met equally across all the languages of the world, so that if a linguist goes and transcribes a word as it is pronounced in Javanese, but then a linguist who is mainly familiar only with French reads that word, but is familiar with the transcription conventions, knows exactly how that word in Javanese is pronounced based on the same conventions that he has learned based on French. Having multiple transcription systems specific to languages as we used to have in the past and as spelling does so often would of course really get in the way of having any sort of scientific progress here and especially nowadays where things are so international and where we work on multiple languages and incorporate data from all sorts of corners of the world it is really really important that we have an internationally agreed system. Now of course linguists and phoneticians especially have been aware of this problem for quite some time and they did something about it. They got together in a society called the International Phonetic Association and they produced something called the International Phonetic Alphabet, short the IPA, which is the system of transcription that we'll be learning today. So as I've said at the beginning of this video today, what we'll be focusing on is the transcription of the speech sounds of English. So let's have a little look at the task that lies ahead of us. So English has around 24 consonantal sounds, including sounds such as p, b, t, d, k, g, l, r, and so on. We'll explore all these in detail in just a moment. And then in the second video later on, we'll also be looking at the vowels of English. English has round about 12 vowels, depending on how you count them, you might double the number. Um, but these include sounds like a, e, e, o, u, things that you are familiar with as vowels, but also their combinations and diphthongs as in ow and oi and things like that. So if you haven't already, this is also a good time to pause the video and go and print out the handout that I've provided together with this video. This handout essentially is an empty version of the IPA chart focused on the sounds of English. And what I would recommend you do is print this out and as you go through the remainder of this video, try and fill in the sounds of English in the chart as that will help you to connect where these sounds sit, how they're categorized and how they're classified as you learn them. So just before we dive into the transcription of English speech sounds and specifically of English consonants, let's take a look and get to grips with the basics of the vocal tract anatomy of a human. And for that, we'll be looking at a sagittal section of the human skull. A sagittal section is one that is taken as though you divide a skull like so, and then you turn it to the side so you can see all the various things that are happening on the inside and the, all the various locations that are going to be of import to us. So have a look at the sagittal section here, and we'll be starting on the outside. We'll be starting exploring the vocal tract from the lips. These are, of course, the two red things that you have on the outside of your mouth here, even though occasionally for some human beings they vary in color. The lips are used in speech sounds such as b, p, m, and f. So they're quite familiar to us, just like the next set of articulators that we find behind them, which are the teeth. These are the vaguely white things that you have in your mouth that sometimes are shown when you feel very friendly or you feel very angry at people. The teeth are also employed in the sound th, but also in English sounds such as the th, the famous th um, that especially speakers of my native German often struggle with. And that is about as much as we can visually see from the outside just looking at the face of a human. So now we really have to get into our sagittal section and look at what happens behind here. So on the sagittal section here, of course, we have the two lips and behind them, we have the two sets of teeth. 
So just behind the teeth here, we find the alveolar ridge. You can also feel this quite easily by taking your fingertip and sort of sliding up on the back of your teeth. There's a really rough and very heavily textured area there. That's the alveolar ridge, which essentially is just the inside of that part of your jaw, which holds the tooth sockets. Now, if you go a little bit farther up just behind that, you will find this portion here. That's the heart palate. And if you probe this again with the tip of your finger, which is something that I recommend you do if you have the possibility of washing your hands anyways, especially at these times, of course, um, then you will feel there is something that's not as textured as the alveolar ridge, but on the roof of your mouth, it's quite hard and there's a little bit of texture. And there's also something called the medial ruffy, uh, a little line that you can feel going along in the middle. That is your hard palate, which in speech, sometimes the tongue likes to press up against. And then if you slide even a little bit farther, you come to a part that is ever so much more tender and soft and hasn't got that texture anymore. It's really quite smooth. That is the soft palate or sometimes also called the velum, which is the term that we'll be employing in linguistics and that you'll come across a lot. So we have the velum here. And then there's another part that most humans are quite familiar with. When you open your mouth all the way up and you look in the mirror, you see a little dangly bit at the back of your mouth. That is the uvula. The uvula sort of dangles to the back. That's one part I would recommend you don't try and probe with your finger because it will probably make you gag. So now we've basically covered the articulatory landmarks on the roof of your mouth. But there's of course one very prominent other thing in your mouth and that is your tongue, which really takes up a vast amount of space in your oral cavity. So the tongue is quite an important articulator which shouldn't be forgotten. Now the tongue, um, we have to divide into a couple of parts that we'll be referring to by different various terms in linguistics. And so first of all, you have what we call the tip of the tongue. The tip of the tongue is the very front. So that refers to this aspect of the tongue here. Or if you just about push your tongue out so much that you can just about see it like so. The part that you see at the very front here, that is the tip of the tongue. And then we divide that and we say just above the tip of the tongue. So this part I'm coloring red here, we call the blade of the tongue. Behind the blade of the tongue, the portion of the tongue that you can sort of extrude that you can stick out. So if you stick your tongue all the way out like so, all the part that is sticking out of your tongue, we we'll call the front of the tongue. So that is roughly that portion here. And then the part behind that we'll call the back of the tongue until it disappears in your mouth at some point and the tongue sort of inserts somewhere down here. That portion we call the root of the tongue. Now, if you want to, you can also um, probe your tongue with your finger. You will feel that the front part and the back part of the tongue have slightly different textures. The tongue gets a little bit rougher on the back of the tongue, but there aren't any sort of very clear anatomical landmarks that will tell you things here. And if you're trying to reach the root of your tongue, you will have the same problem as if you're trying to probe the uvula, it will probably make you gag and will probably not end well. So I recommend you don't do that. So now that we've covered most of what's going on in the oral cavity, let's look down a little bit deeper. Um, there are some other important landmarks here. There's something drawn in that's called the epiglottis, which is a thing here that sits at the root of your tongue. And this is used in some languages to produce speech sounds, but not in English. So we'll just neglect it for today. And then you have something very important and that is the larynx. Of course, especially if you're a male, you're quite familiar with the larynx or sometimes also referred to as the Adam's apple. That's the thing that you can see sticking out here. If you're a female, that's probably quite significantly less dominant. You'll be able to feel it if you put your fingers on your throat and you swallow, you'll feel some part of your throat moving up and down, but it will be quite challenging to just visually identify the larynx in most females. Now the larynx of course is really important because it contains something called the vocal folds. And we'll have a little look at what the vocal folds do exactly in a moment. But the vocal folds are important for distinguishing sounds such as 
where the vocal folds are far apart and where the vocal folds come together to vibrate and give us a voiced sound. So it might look as though we've now covered essentially all the articulators that are involved in the production of speech sounds. But of course, one thing that we haven't paid attention to yet are the various spaces or cavities that we find. And the first one that's important here, just down in the larynx, is of course the opening between the vocal folds where air can pass through from the lungs into the oral tract. And that we call the glottis. So the glottis is the opening between the vocal folds. So then just above the glottis where the trachea and the esophagus, the trachea going to the lungs and the esophagus going to the stomach are divided, we have another opening leading to the oral and nasal cavities and that we refer to as the pharynx. So the pharynx is that little bit there and the pharynx goes into, on the one hand, the oral cavity, so that's the space that you have in your mouth. And on the other hand, air can go into the nasal cavity. So when you're breathing through your nose, for example, or when you're producing speech sounds such as m, n, and ng, you'll be having air passing through your nasal cavity. And the nasal cavity is also regulated by the soft palate or the velum. So the velum, there's a little opening here between the pharynx and the velum. And the velum, of course, if it is raised by a muscle called the levator veli palatini, closes off this passage between the nasal cavity and the pharynx, and then air can only escape through the oral cavity. And sometimes the velum is lowered, and so air can escape through the nasal cavity and then at the same time, if we close off the oral cavity, we just get airflow through the nose. We'll be exploring that in a little bit more detail as we go through the sounds. So let's move on then to transcribing the consonants of English. So consonants are classified according to five factors. First, phonation, which is the aforementioned difference between sounds like s and z. The first one, which is voiceless, and the second one, which is voiced. So that's a property we call phonation, namely whether the vocal folds are engaged or not. Secondly, we have place of articulation. Place of articulation, of course, refers to the location in the oral tract that we've just learned about where the various speech sounds are produced to give them their individual acoustic characteristics. Then we have a property called laterality. So laterality is to do with whether your tongue is sort of bunched up and air can escape on the sides or whether it's curved in in the middle and air can escape in the middle. This is important to distinguish sounds like l, which is a lateral, and r, which is a central, where the air comes out through the middle of your tongue. And then we have the property of nasality, which I've just mentioned at the very end of our little anatomy lesson, where air can either go through the oral cavity and then we have an oral sound or it can escape through the nasal cavity, in which case we have a nasal sound. Finally then, we have a distinction of manner. Manner refers to distinction between groups of sounds such as plosives or stops, where the airflow stops at some point, that sounds like p, t and k, or continuants, which are sounds such as the fricatives, f, s, h, and also things like approximants, approximants being sort of vowel-like consonant sounds. So these are sounds like y and w. Now let's first look at oral stops. So oral stops involve airflow through the oral cavity. So as you can see from the drawing here, the velum is raised at the back and closing off what we call the velopharyngeal port. That's not a term that you need to be able to use actively, but one that's useful to be familiar with. So the port is just an opening between two cavities in the body. So the velopharyngeal port here is closed by the velum, so air can only escape through the oral cavity out that way. Airstream mechanism refers to what the airflow does. Airflow in English is um, by and large pulmonic egressive. Pulmonic egressive means coming from the lungs, the pulmonar, and egressing, so coming out rather than going in. There are languages like Swedish, for example, where you have variants of words like your term for yes, which can be produced when the speech is streaming in. And that has slightly different connotations 
to a normal yaw produced with pulmonic aggressive airstream mechanism. Ingressive airstream is not really used contrastively, especially in languages like English, however. Okay, so we have air streaming out through the oral cavity, and then what it means to be a stop means to stop this airflow. So if we close our oral cavity at any point, perhaps we close it at the lips, perhaps we can close it at the alveolar ridge, perhaps we can close it at the velum, then we get various stops because the airflow is stopped for some time as the oral cavity is closed. So these are the basic ingredients of an oral stop. So let's first look at the voiceless stops of English. Voiceless again meaning where the vocal folds don't vibrate. So the first thing that we're looking at is a voiceless bilabial plosive. Voiceless bilabial plosive is the sound p as we find at the start of words like peak, paper, pot, peter and aspiration. Now an important thing to add here is you might notice that there is a little superscript h at some places but at others there is no little superscript h. So what does this little superscript h mean? This refers to something that we'll call aspiration as in the last word here. So aspiration is a little puff of air that comes out when a stop is released, when the closure where you stop the air from flowing out, when you open that there is a popping sound and if you let a little puff of air escape at this point then that is called aspiration. If you're not sure whether a sound is aspirated or not it's quite easy to tell really. Just put your hand in front of your mouth and whenever there is an aspirated sound, for example if you say paper, you will feel quite a harsh burst of air coming out and hitting the inside of your hand. Now going a little bit farther back in your mouth remember the alveolar ridge, so we can also produce closure at the alveolar ridge where the blade of your tongue presses against the alveolar ridge that occurs in the sound t. For example in time, tattoo, photo, articulation and also in words like prince. So notice here that in the word prince the t is not even spelled but nonetheless it is pronounce. If you're not sure about this and you don't believe me at this point, just go and record yourself, say the word prince and then say the word prince and then go and find one of your friends, play them to two words and ask them to tell you which is which. I'm willing to bet they can't tell the difference. Going even further back in the oral tract we get to velar place. So here the back of the tongue will raise to press up against the velum and stopping airflow there. That occurs in the sound K. So K we find in words such as coat, cough, fromkin, which is a name that you should be familiar with if you have read the textbook Discourse and Consonants. Now there's one voice to stop in English that might not be as obvious to you as P, T and K and that is what we call the glottal stop. So it turns out you can also momentarily stop airflow by closing your glottis. Remember the glottis is the opening between the vocal folds in your larynx and if you put your fingers on either side of your larynx and you say words like uh huh and oh oh and oh oh then you can feel that there is some sort of tension going on, there's something happening in your vocal folds when you say them and it turns out that in the middle of these sounds there is a little stoppage of the airflow by shutting the vocal folds and that's a glottal stop and we write with a symbol that looks kind of like a question mark without a dot. So that's the glottal stop. Now depending on your dialect, especially if you're a speaker of estuary English or you know of a dialect that would be referred to as cogni or perhaps multicultural London English, um, then you might find that you pronounce words like battle or button as battle and button or that you pronounce the word better as better. So in those cases the t sound is also pronounced as a glottal stop and that is a aerial feature of dialects especially in the southeast of England. Now an important distinction to make is that the first three sounds that we've introduced here per, ter and k we refer to as the plosives because they have this burst release of air that is quite audible p, t, k that doesn't occur with the glottal stop uh, uh. 
that doesn't have a burst like this. And so the sounds per, ter and ker are called the plosives, but the glottal stop is only a stop and it's not a plosive. So that's an important distinction to remember. Now let's go over to the voiced variants, so the variants where the vocal folds come into action. So let's again start with the bilabial, so we have the sound B as we find the words like beak, boat, better, syllables, and vibration. Now something to point out is if you're a careful listener in these words, you might actually realize that there is no vocal fold activity in the B that occurs at the start of words like beak, boat, and better, they kind of sound different to those that you find in words like syllables and vibrations. So if I say them in comparison, syllable, beak, you might hear that the starting sound in beak sounds something like the second per in the word paper. Now that's a curiosity of English where in actual fact we find an unaspirated p at the start of words that are spelled with a b. But nonetheless, these sounds, it turns out, are mentally represented as the same kind of unit that we find word internally in words like syllables and vibration. So we will still transcribe them with the symbol for the voiced oral stops, even though they're not in actuality voiced in pronunciation. That's something we'll explore a little bit further next week when we look at the phonology of English. So the next speech sound of course is the alveolar again here. So we have de as in dime, due, made, ride and rodman. Then going even farther back we have vila place again. So we have g as in goad, segments, girls, bugs and fingers. And again all these three sounds have an audible release burst. So these are all referred to as plosives just like their voiceless counterparts. So I said earlier that we're going to have a little closer look at phonation later on. So let's do that now that we've seen that there are actually two groups of sounds here, pater ge on the one hand, bede ge on the other hand, that seem to be distinguished by phonation. So what phonation of course refers to is vibration of the vocal folds. So what does this vocal fold vibration look like? Well, let's take a look here at a little clip taken with a laryngoscope an implement essentially consisting of a strobe light and a camera inserted through the nasal cavity and pointing down behind the vellum, down the pharynx, onto the vocal folds. We can see them from the top here. And we're going to play this little clip, which is a recording of someone just repeating the vowel e, e, e. And this has been slowed down to be about 50 times slower than in real time. So what you could see there, of course, was two phases of phonation with a little break in between where at one point the vocal folds were open for airflow, perhaps the person took a little breath at that point, and then the vocal folds contracted and they were completely closed and shut at one point and the epiglottis you could see rejecting as well, the arytenoid cartilages that you can see at the top, they're sort of becoming very tense and flat, closing everything off. That is what you would also see in a glottal stop and then the vocal folds opened again and the person produced another vowel sound where the vocal folds started once again vibrating. So that is what voicing refers to when the vocal folds vibrate in this manner. And that is also what gives us the distinction between the groups that we refer to as voiced and voiceless sounds. Voiced sounds including such sounds as b, d and g in aba, aga and ada and voiceless sounds, including sounds like per, ter, ker, as in apa, ata, and aka. Now, you can feel this for yourself, putting two fingers on the side of your larynx and saying these sounds in the middle of two vowels. And I recommend R here because R sort of is the most open 
strongest vowel that you can really make. So if you say aba, ada, aga, you can feel that there's really vibration happening throughout. Now, if you compare this and you do this with pitta and ke, and you say apa, ata, aka, you can feel that your vocal folds sort of close off in between and they stop vibrating for a brief moment and then they kick back in. So there is really that differentiation of voicing in these sounds. Of course, because there is no airflow and the vocal folds require airflow in order to vibrate, if you hold a sound like ba, da, and ge long enough, and for example, instead of saying a quick aba, you say abba, then the vibration will still necessarily stop at some point. So to sum up what we've just seen, there are two defining settings that we have to take care of. So first of all, we can ask ourselves, is a stop oral or nasal? In this case, they're oral. That means that the velopharyngeal port is closed. The velum presses up against the back of the pharynx and air can only escape through the oral cavity. And then we can ask what is happening with phonation. Is the sound voiced or voiceless? In addition, of course, we have the different places of articulation. So we have bilabial sounds produced by the adduction of the upper and lower lip. We have alveolar sounds like t and d produced by the blade of the tongue pressing up against the alveolar ridge. And then we have velar stops like k and g as shown here where the back of the tongue presses up against the velum. We of course also had the glottal stop which is produced by pushing together the vocal folds and not letting air through at that point. So what you will find when you look at the IPA chart is an organization roughly like this. And that is of course also what you find on the handout that I recommended you print out earlier and where I would recommend that you try and put these sounds in right now. So we have in the top left corner here bilabial plosives. So what you can tell is that the columns here at the top refer to the place of articulation and you might already be able to tell that the columns here are going to refer to manner of articulation, which of course we'll explore a little bit further as we go. So we have bilabial plosives that gives us sounds like p and b, and now the voiceless one we're always going to put on the left and the voiced one we're going to put on the right. So we get p on the left and b on the right. Then with our alveolar stops, again, voiceless t we put on the left and voice d we can put on the right. And then of course with the velas, voiceless k again we can put on the left and voiceless g we can put on the right. <laughs> now when it comes to the glottal stop, it's of course important to remember that this is not a plosive even though you will find it on the IPA chart in a row that is labeled plosive, you just have to remember we call this a stop and not a plosive because it doesn't have an audible release burst. Now you might wonder why there is a little corner here of the chart that is colored in gray. So have a little think of whether you can come up with an explanation why that might be gray. Now it might be tempting to think at first that yeah, we grayed out this box because English doesn't have a voice glottal stop. But the reality is more dramatic than that. No language in the world has a voice glottal stop. In fact, it is impossible for a human being to produce a voice glottal stop. Why should that be? Well, because voicing, of course, as we've seen, involves the vibration of the vocal folds, while having a glottal stop involves the vocal folds being slammed shut. So you can't do two things at once with the same part of your anatomy. You can't hold your vocal folds closed and at the same time have air passing through so they can vibrate. So it's impossible for a human being to produce a glottal stop. And on the IPA chart, when we deem a sound to be impossible, then we put a gray spot, a gray box in the spot where we would expect to find that sound. So the gray block here means this sound is considered impossible. Now let's move on to nasal stops the equivalent to the oral stops where airflow is stopped at some point, except we're opening the velopharyngeal port. So now air can escape through the nasal cavity and get out through our nose whilst we hold the closure in the oral cavity. So if we are closing our lips or we're closing airflow at the alveolar ridge or at the velum, air can still escape through the nose at the same time. So again, here we have pulmonic aggressive airstream.
and we have an open velopharyngeal port so air can escape through the nose this time. So English has three nasal stops, m, n, and ng. M you find in words like seam, comb, mother, and implicate. N you find in words like sin, not, syntax, son, uni, and nation. And ng, sometimes also called engma, you find in words like sing, think, finger, bang, and linguistics. Now nasal stops in English are almost always voiced. There are some languages where you can get a voicing distinction in nasals. For example, in a language that I'm quite keen on, Welsh, you have a voiceless nasal series as well. So for example, to say my father in Welsh, you would say van hard, where the n of n hard is voiceless aspirated just like we've seen, for example, with the t in time. This does not occur in English, so we'll neglect it here for the time being. So nasal stops, fairly similar in what's happening to the oral stops. And now if we put this all together and we go back to our chart of finding out what sound we're producing, we can ask ourselves again, where does this happen? What is the place of articulation? So if we're at the lips, by labial here, we get sounds p, b, and m. If we're at the alveolar ridge, we get the sounds t, d, and n. If we're at the velum, we get the sounds k, g, and n, or engma. And then if we're stopping airflow in the larynx, we get a glottal stop. Now then, the other two questions that we said we have to ask ourselves are, is that voiced or voiceless? And is that nasal or oral? That is, is the velum lowered so the air can escape through the nasal cavity, or is the velum raised so the air can only escape through the oral cavity, and in that case it's blocked completely for some point. So let's add the nasals to our IPA chart here. So we make a new row below the plosives, we call that nasals, and now we have to put the nasals on the right hand side in their box, of course, because they are voiced, remember. So we have bilabial nasal m, a alveolar nasal n, and a velar nasal n. Glottal nasals, of course, are also anatomically impossible to produce. If you stop airflow down here in the glottis, then air cannot at the same time escape through the nasal cavity. So again, here we can gray out the entire box. Together, the plosives and nasals can be referred to as the stops. So in all of these airflow through the passage of the larynx or the oral cavity is impeded at some point. And when that is the case, we call something a stop. Now let's turn to another manner of articulation, fricatives. Fricatives are made where airflow is hindered somewhat, but not completely stopped. So that's the case in sounds like f and s and sh, where air can still escape even though we're producing some degree of blockage. So in English, we have pairs like f and v. These are the voiceless and the voiced sounds respectively. So this is labial dental. The lower lip um, reaches up against the upper teeth and the air is sort of pressed through between them. That produces these labial dental fricatives. So there we have f in sounds like fine, fabulous, alphabet, life, and form, and then we have the voiced equivalent, v, in forms such as vine, live, value, avian, voice, and vein. So going slightly back in our vocal tract, the next set of fricatives that we get, we get at the teeth, and these can be produced in one of two ways, and it's quite interesting for yourself to find out what kind of an English speaker you are here. They can be produced either incidentally, where the tongue is pressed in between the two teeth, like so. And you can see that visually quite well. Um, if I come much closer to the camera here and I produce an interdental thigh, where my tongue is really between my teeth. And it can also produce that by pushing my tongue against the back of the upper teeth instead, thigh. So you can't see the tongue protruding, but it sounds basically the same. So there are these two ways of doing it, and some speakers do it like this, some speakers do it like that. Um, this is called either an interdental fricative or it is called an alveolodental fricative because your tongue sort of goes between the alveolar ridge and the teeth. So that's the sounds we find in words like thigh, 
through ether, thimble, and absinthe. And then the voiced version we find in words like thy, mother, either, weather, and there. Then going a little bit farther back, so we go back up the alveolar ridge and we press the blade of the tongue sort of very gently against the back of the alveolar ridge so air can still pass through. Then we get sounds like sip, pats, cats, most, and fast. And then the voiced version, we have uh, sounds like zip, jazz, dogs, Xerox, lazy, and maze. So notice here that sometimes, especially in words like dogs, for example, this sound is actually voiced. And you can feel that again if you hold your fingers um, on your larynx and you say dogs, you can feel that there's vibration. You compare that to the word cats, where you can't feel any vibration when you produce that last sound. So if you need to convince yourself, um, you can. You have all the tools at your disposal. Now going even a bit farther back, um, so now remember the heart palate was a thing that we explored a little while ago, even though we didn't need it for the stops in English. That's where we produce the fricatives sh and zh. So we find those in words like shoe, mission, nation, fish, and shore. And then the voice version we find in words such as measure, vision, casual, decision, and rouge. There is another fricative that we can produce in the glottis here, and so that is if we put the vocal folds just sort of very gently, vaguely together so air can get through, but there is a little bit of agitation of the airstream, a little bit of hiss, then we get the H sound that we have in words like hat, who, house, prehistory, rehash, and hand. So looking at the same diagram as we have for the stops before to figure out what sounds we have in English here and how to relate to the anatomy. Um, first of all, let's start here. We have the labiodentals that was F and V where the lower lip goes up against the front teeth. And then just behind that, either interdental or alveolodental, we have F and Th. And then at the alveolar ridge, we have S and Z. And on the heart palate, we have the palatal fricatives sh and zh. Of course, in the glottis, we have h. And again, of course, we can ask ourselves, is this voiced or voiceless? Now, you might ask yourself whether we need to pay attention to nasality in fricatives. And the answer is not really. There is a default assumption that fricatives are always oral and they used to be an established doctrine that that is really what it is. Even though there is evidence that some languages seem to have contrasting nasal fricatives, for example, Applecross Gaelic, a dialect of Scottish Gaelic spoken up in the north of Scotland, but there is still this assumption here that fricatives, unless otherwise indicated, will be oral, and of course English doesn't have any nasal fricatives. So in our IPA chart, we now add another row. We call it the fricatives, so we have another manner of articulation where sounds produce Frication and frication noise, we call them the fricatives. And we start here with the labiodentals, F on the left, V on the right, then the dental category here. As I said, they can be produced either interdentally or alveolodentally in English. We have Th and Th. And then at the alveolar ridge, we have S and Z. At the heart palate, we have the palatal fricatives, SH and Z. And then at the glottis, we can produce the sound H. Now you might notice and you might wonder, well, if for all the other sounds here, we had a gray box in the voiced glottal category here, can we make voiced glottal fricatives? And in fact, you can in many languages, for example, in the north of Africa and in the Middle East, um, quite regular have these voiced glottal fricatives. Um, you can put your vocal folds together so much that there is some frication noise, um, but you still have vibration of them because you don't need to completely stop airflow. You can do that. So now the last group of sounds that we're going to look at in this video are the approximants and the approximants can be divided into the liquids and into the glides. So let's take a look at the liquids first. The liquids refer to the sounds L and R. So L is the sound that you find in words like leave, lord, call, single and include. And R is the sound that you find in words like reef, and rate. And then for some people, if you're speaking what is called a rhotic dialect of English, you'll find that in words like fear, core, and butcher, where you can hear, I don't have it. But if I try and say it in a rhotic manner, then it would sound something like this, fear, core, butcher. So that is a dialectal variant that exists in English 
um, where people might have the sound word finally as well. So both of these liquids are produced at the alveolar place and what distinguishes them is that in leaf the air escapes on the sides of the mouth so we have what we call laminal airflow while in the rear sound the air escapes over the middle of the tongue so we have what we call central airflow. Now similar to nasals liquids in English are typically voiced even though they have voiceless variants and in English we also find the voiceless version sometimes occurring principally in a cluster of consonants when they directly follow a voiceless stop then we get a voiceless version of them and again you can figure this out by sort of feeling your larynx and saying words like play or blue. In blue you will feel that there's vibration and in play you will feel that there's no vibration you have this voiceless l. And then as I just said the l is a lateral liquid and the r is a central liquid and they're both alveolar. Now the other group of approximants that we find in English are the glides which are sounds that are very much like vowels. In English we have two to three of them depending on your dialect so you might have y, w and then a voiceless version of w. So y is in what we call post alveolar position so it's somewhere between the alveolar ridge and the heart palate in pronunciation and that you find in words like you, yes, unit and use. Notice here that in English of course y is quite often not spelled. Then we have the sound w which really has a double articulation. On the one hand it involves the two lips as you can see when you say a word like which and swim the lips are coming together but on the other hand you also have velar articulation so this has a double articulation we call it the labial velar approximant. So the labial velar approximant where we find words like which, swim and queen and then depending on your dialect this has sort of been dying a slow death over you know the last century of English history. Um, you might still find people that have a voiceless version of that. A famous example is Stewie saying cool whip in Family Guy um, and you have this in words like which, where and whale for people that still have that version. For most speakers of English nowadays of course this will just be which, where and whale with the same voiced w. Now just like the liquids the glides are usually voiced by default but there are voiceless variants that occur including in some varieties of English. So let's put our liquids and glides, our approximants on the map. So as I said there's this double articulation here we have w being produced at labial and at velar position at the same time so the back of the tongue raises to constrict airflow at the velum and at the same time the tongues come together a little bit and then we have the sounds r and l at the alveolar ridge and we have y at post alveolar position just a little bit behind them and they're usually voiced but voiceless variants of them occur. So let's add them to our IPA chart here and we'll introduce two columns this time. We'll introduce one that we'll just call the approximants and the assumption here is that we have central airflow or non-laminal airflow and then we have one called the lateral approximants where air is flowing at the side. So now the first one that we can put in is the labial velar and you will notice here that it's put in in two positions simultaneously on the left and on the right to take care of that double pronunciation. The same of course if you put in the voiceless variant I've put that here in parenthesis because of course it might not occur in your dialect but it's important to know that symbol. Um, and then of course we have y here as well so y and w are the glides and then we have r and l at alveolar place um, which differ in whether they have central or lateral airflow. So those are the two liquids that we've looked at. Okay so to quickly summarize what we covered in this video we first of all looked at the idea of transcription and we saw that transcription must be unambiguous and international. We want one symbol, one value across all the languages of the world so even if I describe a language that you don't know somewhere else in the world and I send you my transcripts you know exactly what sort of sounds I'm talking about. Then we looked at articulation and we saw how the individual consonants 
of English are produced, and we got enough of an idea of how they're organized and classified that even the sounds on the IPA chart that you haven't learned about today, you can probably figure out in your own devices. And I would encourage you to do that, um, how to produce and what they sound like. And then we've looked a little bit at the idea of classification. So that's really what we've done when we put these things into this table format that they come in, in the IPA, in the International Phonetic Alphabet. And what we've seen there is that consonants can be systematically classified according to their articulatory settings, according to their phonation, their manner of articulation, their place of articulation, their nasality, and their laminality, where the air flows out at the sides of the tongue or central through the middle of the tongue. And it turns out, as we will see next week, that these articulatory features and classifications actually matter in the mental representation of speech sounds as well. So take a little break now, you really deserve it. And then in the second video today, we'll be taking a quick look at the vowels of English. And I promise this will be a lot easier and a lot quicker.